we'll pause for a minute. All right, so this topic of this tree's tidbit is why standards-based grading. And I threw the word assessment there in parentheses um, because really we're starting to make this shift into assessment world as opposed to just a, a grade on a particular thing. We're assessing things and looking at what does that word assessment really mean in the big scope of some of the work that we're doing. Our mission, Growing World Changers, our vision is to design meaningful learning experiences that develop effective communicators, resilient learners, global citizens to become tremendous trailblazers. All right, introductions. I'm Shannon Treese. Um, I know all of you all. I'm the Executive Director of Schools. Ms. Carrie Luter is behind you. She is the Director of Curriculum Instruction. Mr. Fennell and Ms. Sanford are running their buildings at this moment, so they are not present, um, but they are more than willing to uh, help out as needed with any concerns or questions that parents have regarding standards-based grading. We're gonna start with the presentation, um, get into the why. I'm gonna show you a little bit of our strategic um, priorities and key goals for the schools related to uh, standards-based grading, and then question and answer. We'll do a quick school tour if you guys are interested. Um, and then we'll conclude. So resources for deeper learning. Um, we have two book studies that are happening right now with our teachers that they are welcome to join if they want. Some of our teachers are further down the road with this implementation than others. If they've been with us since year one, uh, we did this book study on transforming schools year one. Um, and then this year we are adding in the repair kit for grading 15 fixes for broken grades. And that really is about some of the myths around grading. You can come on up if you want to get closer. I don't bite, I promise. Thank you for coming. Both of these are relatively easy reads. If parents wanted to pick them up and read them, you definitely could, and it would give you some of the perspective of where we're coming from and the work that we're doing around development of curriculum and really making sure that we're attending to the academic standards along with the rigor. Um, so that, will, that would give you that perspective. The repair kit for grading is going to be really specific to why traditional grading systems are ineffective for learners. Um, and I did this book study probably, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago with staff, and it's just as relevant, if not more relevant, then, uh, now than it even was then. Our teachers have had some really big ahas around um, the work that we've done uh, with that particular book. ChatGPT, has anybody heard of that one lately? So I'm obsessed um, with ChatGPT, and that is AI technology. Uh, that's an actual site, and if I knew it would work, I would pull it up. Can I do that, CJ? Can I try it? Um, yeah, that's not gonna be the right, that's not gonna be the right one either. Well, I don't think I have it. I don't think I have it up. Maybe I have it, there we go. I thought I made it a live link. So it kicked me out. It's going to take too long probably to make this work. And I definitely do not remember my password. So never mind. All right. So I'm going to give you an example because I printed one. So ChatGPT is a place where you can put in a topic, you can put in whatever information that you want it to write about, and it will actually write um, the paper for you. So a few students I heard in Lee County, I think use ChatGPT for an essay in a class, and I think somebody picked up on it, and so now we're figuring out what does that look like ethically around like using other people's work. But just to show you kind of um, the technologies that are coming around, I'll give that, and you guys can pass it that away. Thank you for coming this morning. But I typed in uh, standards-based grading, <clears throat> and it churned that particular definition out, which is pretty on par for exactly what it is, and it took maybe 30 seconds for it to create this language. Um, so this is really just perspective as to why standards-based grading is also important and being able to show mastery in different ways is important um, because of technologies like this that can do lots of work um, for us really quickly. 
oh shoot, I'm going the wrong way. So really the focus um, is on data-driven instruction and the assessment of and for learning. Uh, we're not gonna drill into that super deep, but that really is um, the gist of where we're going. The purpose of standards-based grading um, or a purpose of assessment is to communicate students' level of mastery over standards. So we really wanna understand where a student is in terms of mastering the particular standards that we've identified that must be measured. We're responsible for teaching all the standards, so I wanna be clear, like we don't get to negotiate, well, we're gonna teach this one and not this one. We're responsible for teaching every standard um, and the standards that Florida says go with this particular course, this particular course. The standards that we assess are those standards that are higher level standards that are gonna encompass lower standards within the standard, if that makes sense. So you've got some high level standards, you're gonna have some standards that students have to know in order to be able to show mastery of that higher standard. There's no way to realistically measure 180 standards you know, for a student in the elementary school. Um, that's just not a feasible uh, ask of teachers. They would, they would quit faster than they already are in education. So we don't wanna kill them any quicker <laughs> with that. <coughs> The goal ultimately is to provide good, timely, specific, and fair feedback for the student and for you as a parent to really know where your child is performing. The why, um, quality data matters. Good data in, we say, is good data out. So the better data that we can have to look at and really assess where a student is, the better off we are in terms of planning lessons and responding to what our curriculum needs to look like. The effective use of data is critical to student growth. Um, again, we gotta know where they are to get them further down the road and to get them deeper into their understanding and learning. And then this one is a big sticky wicked for me is mastery learning versus an average. An average really doesn't tell me anything about where a kid is. An A for one teacher is not an A for another teacher. Uh, you know, an A for one is a C for another. And so it doesn't really tell me where that student is. Um, and those that have been around me enough, you've heard me talk about, you know, people question how do you end up as a, a graduate of, of a course, you know, you move from middle school and you go to high school and you can't do the math. It's because of averages. You know, you can get a 65 average, not complete, you know, much more than half the material and go to the next level and continue to struggle because we didn't identify exactly what standards you were missing and what you needed to be working on. So those gaps tend to just get bigger over time as opposed to smaller, where with a standards-based system where we know what a student needs to work on, we can spend that time doing exactly what they need to be doing as opposed to just a plethora of worksheets that may or may not hit what it is that we're after for that piece of student growth. This particular slide is just big picture. And my little red dot doesn't like, it doesn't like the screen, CJ. I'm gonna have to have an old school pointer. Um, but the, the really what I want you to look at here is these are on the top, on the top chart, you can see Babcock Neighborhood School um, grades. And if you look at the very top line of the numbers, it's probably really hard for you guys to see now that I'm looking at it on the screen, but it goes through every single component that we're scored on for the state score. So ELA achievement, ELA learning gains, ELA learning gains, uh, for the lowest 25th percentile. These are all categories that we get scored in. So when we get a school grade, it's a compilation of all of this data. You get one big letter, right? You get an A or you get a B or you get an F. Again, it gives you some collateral information, but not a lot, right? As a parent, you just know, okay, well, it's an A school. They must be doing really, really good. When in essence, we have been an A school but there are areas of improvement that we still need to work on within those components because we can drill into that data in those particular areas where we're looking for growth. The bottom chart is the high school. And this one was one that I could actually, I can reach this one. Um, but if you look in this one at the ELA achievement, is it 52? So in that particular category, we, received a C. There we go. Look at you. That's awesome. And then here, our actual 
in 21-22 was a 49, but in 2021, we had an 86. So that makes us as administrators go, all right, like let's sit down at the table, what happened there? Is it because of the numbers of students? Is it a teacher issue? Is it a curriculum issue? Is it a, what is it? So just when we're looking at those overall components, again, that just gives us opportunity for discussion more than anything. And we, we did pretty rough in some areas and we still ended up with an overall B. But then we take it to the next level, right? Do you have questions on that? This one, this one was just to show you the purpose of the overview of like big data. Yes. Oh, we identify all kinds of issues. That's what we do. That's our work, right? Yeah, I'm going to share some of it. <laughs> these are, so I pulled random slides. So don't, like these are all slides from other presentations that I've done for accreditation or district um, reports and things that I have to do. But again, why, why, does, why do standards matter? Why does standards-based grading matter? Well, it matters because you're gonna take those big numbers, right, that are on that chart, and you're gonna break it down into, all right, how did our students perform? So the students tested that earned a three to five proficiency, which is what we want at a minimum, right? You want students to live here as much as possible. But you also wanna see all right, we've got 19% in 2018, 2019, 19% of our students were in this level one category. So then COVID hits and there's some weirdness, so we missed some data there because we don't take state testing that particular year. Um, standards change, so that's also sometimes an outlier that we have to take into consideration. But what I wanted to show here, so for in this particular category, in fourth grade ELA, 66% of our students we're at a level three to five proficiency. Last year they were 63, so we lost a little bit. Well, we can actually go in and look and see like what, where we lost some of that ground. I mean, we really wanna drill into that detail um, so that we can see it. And you can see, even though we're at a 63, we're still outperforming the district um, and the state in most every category. I I'm not gonna go through every single grade level because the point of this is to just show, again, high level data, grade level data. So here, we went from 47% up to a 70. That was in third grade. So whatever we did in third grade worked. <laughs> whatever we adjusted, whatever we changed from 2020 year to 21-22 definitely had some positive impact. And you know, again, just outperforming the state and Charlotte County schools. We want to you know, make sure that we're not losing ground and when we do, ask those hard questions. So data equals goals, right? We look at the data, now we've gotta create some goals. This is a quick snapshot of some of the goals that we focused on as a result of our data this particular year. So one of our goals was to decrease the percentage of level ones for students with disabilities in both ELA and math by 25% to achieve a 41% in ELA and a 45% in math this equates to moving 13 students from level one to level two in ELA and 15 students in math. So that's a lot of language, right? Well, in order for us to get to these 15 students and these 13 students, we've got to know how the students are performing. That goes back to that standards-based grading piece. We want to look at where students are performing in terms of standards. We want to see where they haven't met the growth that they need to be meeting. That's when the interventions start coming into play. That's when Ms. Luter is meeting with those teachers, the teachers are developing their lessons, and they're going, you know what, these six students are really struggling with these components, that's what they need to spend their extra um, intervention time working on. Those are six different goals, we're not gonna get into those because it's not, not really what the point is. Um, but again, how are we going to do this? We're gonna rely on standards-based instruction, close monitoring of student performance, we're gonna use things like Lexia, Achieve 3000, Alex, IXL. We have a plethora of interventions and curriculum resources that we can use depending on the student. It really depends on what the student's needs are and the type of learner that the student is that also plays into this. It isn't a cut and dry method. I know a lot of times parents just want, well, just give me the fix. Just give me the worksheets, right? We hear, we're hearing that a lot lately. Just give us more worksheets. That may or may not solve the issue. We, 
we've got to understand the child, we've got to understand how the child learns and how they process and what it is that they need before we just start throwing worksheets at them. Because worksheets may just frustrate the problem and not get us anywhere where we need to be in terms of the learning that we're looking for. All right, individual student data is critical to achieve growth. So we use the four point scale. And if you've been to the standards-based uh, training, uh, then you've seen this. Um, some of you have seen it multiple times. This, again, is just to help parents get their head around what it is that we're looking for and that a three is mastery and three is proficient, right? That, so that's a little bit of a brain transfer because we're used to, you know, four, you know, being, you know, we want to equate four to an A and that's just not accurate. Um, four is being able to go above and beyond what the standard is asking. A three is I've met the standard solid and I've met it over time very solid. Like I can demonstrate my learning over time consistently and, and I'm on par. Um, and that's what we want. We want students to make sure that they're achieving that proficiency level. Students are gonna start in some areas at a one and sometimes they're gonna start at a three. There, there are some students that are just really strong in certain components of math, but they're weak in others. Um, and that's really how we assess and determine what the instructional lessons and units need to look like in the classroom. That's how those teachers are designing that with that very specific information. All right, back to the 13 students and the 15 students. What does an A versus a C tell us about what a student can, uh, what a student knows? There is a spelling error. This is what happens when you edit at 10 o'clock at night. I told him, I said, I bet I've missed some. Uh, what a student knows and can demonstrate. Um, Knowing it and being able to demonstrate knowing can sometimes look differently for students. I use this also in the standards-based grading. Um, this is, a, this is my, always my example for why averages really are not how the real world functions. Um, because if you go and take your driver's test, if the goal is to get your driver's license and you fail your test the first time on the written, you go home, you study, you come back, you take a second piece, you pass the written part, but you fail the driver's part you still just fail the test, you don't get your driver's license, you come back the third time and you pass them both and guess what? What do they give you? They give you a driver's license. They don't average it and say, oh, I'm sorry, out of the three times you only got a 63, you don't get your driver's license. No, they give it to you. But yet in schools, we consistently use that average to determine where a student is you know, in their progression of learning and it's just an inaccurate approach. We're not gonna go through all of these because most of you have been pretty engaged um, in our process, but the rationale is really clarity for students, parents, and teachers. At the end of the day, it really is all about the accountability of students knowing where they are in their learning, where they need to go in their learning, and us figuring out how to get students on that pathway um, to growth. Because ultimately, that's what we wanna see. We want a student to leave with more knowledge and more depth of understanding than when they came to us. In our particular system, we also focus on pace. Um, it's important for students to be on pace. This is a really hot topic of discussion right now for our teachers. Um, part of it came from the book study. Part of it is just this mentality that we're seeing from our students that nah, I don't have to do it as long as I do it by the end of the year, the time doesn't matter. Time does matter. Um, it doesn't matter in regard to a nine week stop gap um, and, and the grade being an average, but you still need to be on pace because you cannot really learn effectively the things you need to learn in March if you haven't paid attention in October. So we are really looking at some systems for if a student isn't completing what that needs to look like, how can we intervene? For example, I've been in schools previously where they have a fall break and the first week of fall break is all about making up any missing assignments. Um, so in theory, you're never more than nine weeks behind. So you go nine weeks, any assignments or anything um, within your standards that are missing, you would work on that first week of fall break. You would get your second week of fall break as a break. You come back kind of on track. You're not behind again because in high school, the residual piece of being behind can get really overwhelming for students. 
So, you know, by Christmas, they've almost given up because now I'm 18 weeks behind. There's no way I can catch up. So there's um, schools that really try to focus on ensuring that students aren't getting so far behind that they can't get caught up. I will say the pandemic and hurricanes have definitely impacted our ability to utilize the fall breaks as we have wanted to. Hopefully we can get back on track uh, with that and emphasize more in-depth pace with our students. Um, we want students to be on pace. This is where they should be um, in the course. And if these are green, then you're good. If you're in there and they're yellow, then you've, you've got problems with pace. Um, but that's, again, just the student staying on track with um, the timeline of what the teacher is moving through. So in the system, this is where it gets really personalized. Teachers within Empower, within that platform for learning, can really control what a student is doing. So there may be a student that needs to do these six things, but the student over here maybe only needs to do one of those because they've already demonstrated mastery of a standard and they don't need to complete everything. Um, so within that platform, the teachers can actually um, assign certain things to certain students depending on um, their particular needs. Uh, we will refer to that as differentiation in the classroom um, or personalized learning, just attending to that student learner um, with exactly what they need. On here, I know it's, it's probably a little hard to read, but you can see that the goal score is on the right side. The goal score is 3.0 on everything. And you can see on this particular standard for social studies 8.A.1.1 provides supporting details for an answer from text, interview for oral history, check validity of information from research text, identify strong versus weak arguments. This particular student earned a three. On this particular standard, view historic events through the eyes of those who were there as shown in their art, writings, music, and artifacts. This student is performing at a 2.0. Um, they haven't gotten to mastery yet, so they're making progress, not quite there yet. That's exactly what we would expect mid-year. So this was a mid-year report that I had pulled. Um, that student probably started out at maybe a 1 or 1 1.5. You know, now they're up to a 2. The goal is by the end of the year, they'll be at a 3. In these standards, we can drill down and see exactly what it is that the teacher assigned to the student. So you as a parent can go in and actually see the activities. And this is not an Empower training, but just to show you how we get to the standards-based grading information, right? The assessment that we're looking for to drive that mastery of the standard. So here, um, when you're looking at the standard, you can pull out the evidence and actually look again at what the student got. All right, we're changing a class maybe. This is a wonky day because it's a half day. It is. It's, it is. It actually, you know, we weren't sure how this space was going to work. We had big ideas of what we wanted, but it has actually been utilized extremely well. And it is one of my favorite things to just walk and watch the students interacting in this space and utilizing this space as it was designed, which is collaborative space. So for those at home, we have a, a little bit shifting of students here, so we'll give it a second so they can, but it isn't super loud. They really do a great job. They really do. <laughs> Am I doing okay, CJ? Any questions while? I can, that's a good idea. Do you guys have questions while they're adjusting? Is, are there any questions that I could tackle? I ran them off? Got it. A lot. There's a lot across the country. Is it yes. Public and charter and private or all, public? all. Yep. Some Denver, like out in Colorado, a lot of your states that are a little further down the line of innovation have been doing it for a long time. I mean, there have been schools that have been doing it for, for that book. The book that I showed earlier, yeah. it's like 20 years old. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah. It, you're, you will probably, yeah, you'll probably see a lot of schools, I've already seen a lot of shifts because of the pandemic, because right. students have moved all over oh, and yeah. they're coming in and it's like, where are they? So well, the only way to really know is to really assess and dive into the standard. So you, there were some schools out in California um, and some other places that the whole district just shifted all at once, um, which is a really heavy lift, um, but it was the, it, in the situation that we're currently in, it probably is the right answer because you can do it slow, but you can also do it fast, and it's probably just as hard either way, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, there's schools all across the country that do this and have done it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just a hard shift, right? It's a hard. It is. Well, it's an aspect of um, I think we just have to have an open mind. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so, okay. Yeah, he, perfect. Yeah, but we knew right away the first five minutes we were hearing about it. We just did a little research and we were like, for our kids, it's mm -hmm. we're like, it just needs to be this. And we have all eight, six, thirds. So we knew we had such a big spread and we could tell from our third term. I just, I just sure it was like that. Mm -hmm. something, something, there's like a lot of amazing in kindergarten and then mm -hmm. a year and a half of no teacher training essentially. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it definitely, and it, it's, it, I just wanted to hear firsthand from you other than my kids itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully the, hopefully too, the intrinsic motivation of knowing that it has meaning and being able to go, okay, you know, as a student, I'm here, here, and here. These are the things I need to work on so that I'm not sitting in a class, you know, doing a bunch of projects overall that don't really mean anything to me or my learning growth process. So, um, you know, it's. And it is a process in onboarding parents and students. is really going to be an emphasis for us moving forward is the feedback that students get. So when students are submitting their uh, work um, in here for assessing, teachers can give them really specific information about, hey, I like this. And this particular one, you know, you've got some pretty good information, but are you really answering it? Go back and look at your later sentences. Um, so again, giving the students some direction about where to go look at their assignment to where they can improve it. In the platform, again, there's pace. There's work that needs to be resubmitted, submitted work, your playlist browser, but also you can see what your student learner has been working on or what their last um, kind of click in there that they were attending to in regard to the specific standards. This is a snapshot of a, one of the progress report buttons that you can hit. Um, and again, you can see we're shooting for threes, but this is math. Um, these are all maths, very specific math standards. This particular student is performing at a 2.5 across the board, except for one that has not been scored. If you want to see how that 2.5 is derived, you're going to click on the evidence. And that evidence um, will pop up and it will give you some specifics around the performance. This is ELA. This is one that I actually pulled a little bit deeper information on. So again, you can see the different standards everywhere from use of figurative language down to research, paraphrasing. <coughs> the assignments that the student completed. And then the comment. Your second sentence is not used correctly. If you want a higher score, please redo and submit it. So the teacher is giving some direct feedback about, you know, here's where you scored, but if you want to improve it, here's a way to do that. This is the progress report that probably parents like the most, right? Because it's very specific. It gives you, it gives you your standard. It gives you your score. Again, why is that important? 
Anybody want to chime in? Yeah, because this really tells you exactly where they're at. It's not just a worksheet, worksheet number one, worksheet number two, or you know, the Geography of America worksheet doesn't really tell you what the student is learning. This is going to be a very specific emphasis on what the student is learning, and the emphasis is that we want threes by the end of the year. That's the goal is for a student to be at a three at the end of the year. So I had a parent in a parent meeting give some good feedback, um, and they said, you know, it's just hard to get your head around standards-based grading a little bit. Um, and they said one of the teachers had used the example of a car um, being plugged in and determining what was wrong with it, um, you know, where it tells you exactly, you know, what it is as opposed to, well, it's just, you know, the car is broken down. Well, what is wrong with the car? Um, is it, you know, that it's out of fuel? Is the tire low? Is it, you know, what is it? That really is what standards-based grading is trying to get um, to, is really identifying what's the issue so that we can plan for how to address that learning for the student. I'm not going to get into this piece. <coughs> Standard-based assessment of learning allows the educator to meet specific learning needs of every student. Um, and then I threw this in here. Does anybody know the significance of 212? Carlo, you got it. What's 212? Let me add this to it. What's 200? What happens at 212 degrees? Oh, we need to up our science standards. You have it in math? All right, 212 degrees is when water boils. And so we always talk about Babcock schools being innovative and being on the cutting edge. And so I threw the 212 degrees in there. It's, you know, at 211. We're just like everybody else. But we really want to up the level of expectation for our students, our staff, and our families to get students as much prepared as possible, as, as all the things that we can load into them in the time that we have them so that when they graduate and transition into their post-secondary adventures, whether it be college or whether it be the workforce, whether it be the military, that they've got the academia you know, I, you will always hear me say, this piece is non-negotiable. I mean, the standards have to be taught. That is the expectation of schools. That's what we're here to do is make sure kids are prepared academically. The other piece that many times we don't do a great job, in my opinion, in schools are the durable skills, the communication, the organization, you know, building those competencies so that when I get out in the real world, I know how to speak to my employer appropriately. I know that if I don't come prepared, there are going to be consequences, and I know how to receive those consequences, as opposed to getting into an argument or creating an issue with it. Um, but being at work on time, all of those things that um, lead to success, um, because we really believe, you have an admin team here that really believes that we are more than education here. We want the whole experience, the whole child. We want them doing the PBL experiences because of what they bring to the table from those durable skills to collaborate with the academic skills and intersect at the appropriate points in time to get that learning. Um, so when I'm asked why standards-based grading, it's not an easy answer, but it's collectively all of this information, right? It's taking big data about where a school is performing, looking at grade level data to make meaning out of it so that we can adjust our curriculum and ensure that we don't have gaps. It's taking that curriculum and drilling it down to the student level and looking at each individual student and where those students are in that curriculum and having our teachers design those meaningful PBLs, those meaningful, highly engaging lessons that really get students passionate about learning. Um, and so that's why teachers are tired in this process. This is a, it's a lot of work, um, but in order to get the growth that we want to get out of our students, and have maximum potential for students, we have to know where they're performing in all of those categories and in all of those standards that are priority for moving to the next grade level and being successful. So that is what I have. Um, and if you have questions, I am happy to answer them. I'm, I'm liking the stick, CJ. This brings me back to my eighth grade <coughs> media class. <coughs> I thought, sorry. I've got the crud. I'm, I apologize. Yeah. 
Oh, do you want me to cut it off? Before I tell a bad joke? 